tonight with our youth. They're going to be very involved in our service, doing a number of different things and specials and music and so forth. And so I trust it will be a blessing tonight. Our song leader is going to be uh, Cody. So, Cody, if you'll come and lead us in a song. All right. Let's turn in our song books to page 414. Trust and obey. We can go ahead and stand up as we turn. 414. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer tonight, and uh, I'm going to ask uh, Thomas Owens if he'll pray for us. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come to your house tonight and to hear from your word. We the opportunity to worship you and show you love, Lord. We pray that you with the teams as they honor you in the service tonight. That you allow us to help us hear from your word. We pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. I believe Cody has a special for us.
That was a blessing. Let me take a moment to welcome you to our service tonight. Of course, uh, we are going to be hearing some more from our youth. We appreciate them being engaged. We like to see them every once in a while, see them participate. And just a special guest we got in our service tonight, not really a guest in a way, but she's not able to come very often, Dot Lanier is in our service. And uh, Miss Dot, we got a lot of new people don't even know you, but Miss Dot was along with the Shree uh, and the Seegers, the original family that was here at the church. And so uh, we're just a blessing tonight that she's able to be here. And uh, you keep her in prayer. She's got some health struggles. And if she doesn't immediately recognize you, she don't see that good. You didn't drive here tonight, did you, Miss Dot? Okay. <laughs> all right. Just checking. She did that for a while and scared us all. But anyway, we're glad that she could be here. We're glad that all of you can be here. We trust the service will be a blessing tonight. We're going to sing again. So, uh, Cody, lead us in another song. 187, Amazing Grace. Um, you can stay seated on this one. We're going to sing the first, second, third, and the sixth. If you have your bulletins, there's a list of announcements in there. It's quite a long list. We go all the way down through a month from now. It's crazy we're talking about March already. But in that, a couple things that we do want to draw your attention to. Uh, we have the Grand Prix on Saturday. We'll have that here at the church. Registration will open at 9 o'clock. We'd encourage you because we're going to have to do some weights and that kind of stuff to get here as close to that time as possible. We will also have the scale available on Wednesday night, so we can start working on some of that weights and stuff on Wednesday night, try to get the vehicles close to the right weight, uh, which is always a fun task. And then on the 28th, guys, pay close attention to this one. Yes, your wives are going to this. You have the kids that night. I keep on telling you, for this, this is for me, not for you, I promise. But uh, they have ladies' night out. They'll be meeting at Nukes there in Somerville. Of course, any details on that, uh, you can see Mrs. Bailey. She can answer those questions for you. She would love to answer those questions for you. Um, and then we have, of course, some teen activities coming up, which they already know about. You should have been told about by your teenagers, but in case you didn't, they are in the bulletin. So that's coming up here for you. Uh, there's a couple different things in there. We do also have coming up on the 8th the men's chili cook-off. We'll get more details about that in the days ahead. But we're looking forward to a good time that for the men and some shooting and some other stuff going on there as well, which is always fun. At this time, Cheyenne has a special, and I'm not sure what the special, uh, looks like a ukulele is coming up here. So this should be good.
shout of acclamation and lead me home with joy shall fill my heart then i shall bow in humble adoration and then proclaim my god how great thou art last song is going to be 396, When the Roll is Caught Up yonder, yonder. Go ahead and stand as we turn to 396. We're going to sing all the verses. These young people are doing a tremendous job. Amen. Cassie Brewer, she's uh, playing the piano for us on our congregationals, and so I'm glad to know we've got uh, a fill-in if nobody shows up. Only problem is they're all going to graduate and go off to college, and then some sorry man's going to take them, move them over halfway across the country. But, <laughs> but, but anyway, we're glad to be able to have them part of it. Haley's going to be playing the offertory for us. Now, guys, you're ushering tonight. We always have a – ushers always throw in $20 to get everything started. So, <laughs> But uh, anyway, appreciate these guys taking the offering tonight. Josh, will you pray for the offering for us? Dear God, um, please be with uh, the service. Thank you for um, letting us come here today. Please use the money for you and be with uh, Mr. Fox as he preaches. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.
certainly it's a blessing tonight to hear from these young people, and uh, God has given us a lot of talent that we're seeing develop, and we praise the Lord for that, and I praise the Lord for these kids being involved in that. Now, along with our youth, one of our uh, great assets that we have is our uh, youth leader, Mr. Michael Fox. Um, I don't want to tell him this, but he saved us a lot of money over the years <laughs> not having to hire a youth pastor. Uh, believe it or not, he has a full-time job as well, and he does this on the side. So he does a great job. The kids love him, and he puts a lot into it and prays for these kids and uh, invests in them. And, of course, he uh, gives them a lesson on Wednesday night and takes care of the Sunday school on Sunday morning. So he has a lot of responsibility above his own job investing in these kids. Certainly we appreciate his doing that. And I like to give him an opportunity when we have these youth services to be able to uh, – speak to the parents directly and be able to share something from God's word. So we're going to ask Michael to come tonight and share what God's laid on his heart. Thank you, Pastor. And I want to say thanks to all our teenagers. They did a great job. What a blessing. And I'm always surprised when we do this. Somebody's like, like Cody, I didn't even know you could play the guitar like that at all. <laughs> Never heard anything besides the bass over there with John here. So, where are you, Cody? Oh, good job. Thank you. He didn't really want to do the singing, but he said, you know what? If nobody else will lead it, I'll do it. And I think he did great. All right. So, we've been talking about Titus with the teenagers on Wednesday night, going through the book. And there was a, a part there that I kind of just glossed over with the teenagers. I thought I'd save it for tonight. It's in Titus chapter 2. If you want to turn there in your Bibles. Let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for letting us come together. Thank you for these teenagers that were able to uh, use their talents for you tonight, God. I pray that you would help them to do that, to give you their lives, Father. I pray that you continue to, to bless them and um, others in our youth group that would be inspired to live for you and, and uh, serve you, Father. We uh, ask you to just minister to us through your word tonight, Father. Use it to change us and help us to have some direction in how we can better serve you ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so you'll figure out why I saved this one for tonight. Um, let's start in Titus chapter 2, verse 1. It says to Titus, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith and charity and patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. So I'm always talking to young people normally. Tonight I wanted to talk a little bit to the aged people in our church. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not going to ask for a show of hands if that applies to you. Um, but let's, let's talk about that. Who does that apply to when it says let the aged men be a certain way and let the aged women be a certain way and have them teach the people that are younger than them? Um, you know, really, age is a relative thing, right? I was looking it up, and in the 17th century, it turns out the life expectancy then was 35. So I think that a lot of us are old enough to be aged for that time period. Um, Another thing that's relative is it depends on how you how old you are whenever you think about how old it is. You know, I remember being young, and matter of fact, you, you know, I've asked some people, and for instance, I asked Piper, I said, Piper, am I young? Piper's my six-year-old little girl. I said, am I, am I young or am I old? And uh, you all know what she said. She didn't just say you're old. She was like, you're old. You know, I mean, she's like, what do you mean? You're, you're old, like ancient. Um, so really... Whatever age you are, especially if you're some level of an adult, I'm sure you have people that are younger than you that would look up to you in a certain way. Even if you're a 17-year-old and you've got a younger sibling, younger brother or sister, we need to live our lives so that they can look up to us and learn how to be a better Christian. How, how can they live for God? How can they put some of the doctrinal things that uh, Paul writes to Timothy or, or to Titus, both really, how can they put those things to use in the real world, and some of those things are better caught than taught, as they say. Some of those things, you can't just tell how to do it. You kind of have to show how to do it, and that takes the older men in the church and the older women in the church, 
and it's important. Titus was given the job of putting some things in order. Paul told him, go to this church, set some things in order, and one of those things was to teach the older men and the older women how to live so that they could help the younger generation come along and live for God. So that's what I want to talk about tonight. Um, let's start off in verse 2 here. It says that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate. Um, you know, these are some things that we can teach younger men. Um, we all need help like this. You know, when you look at what it means to be a young man, you don't always think of somebody being sober and having a lot of self-control and um, being reserved. But that's something that we need to, um, to be able to look up to older men for, to, to be respectable. And if you're a younger man, um, you need to aspire to be that way. Sound in the faith, sound in love, and sound in patience. And the older women, likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. In other words, it goes along with being holy. But what Act like someone that's holy. How should they act? What goes along with holiness? We'll talk about some of that. Not false accusers, not given to much wine, and teachers of good things. You know, I'm thankful that there's some really good women teachers that we have for Sunday school, things like that. I know some of my kids' favorite Sunday school teachers are women. Um, and we get to hear stories about them. One that comes to mind is Miss Zipper. I mean, she's always got some animated things about some of these stories that they get in the car and they're like, did you know that the Egyptians were throwing little babies to alligators? And, you, you know, and you're like, wow, that, you know, their eyes are this big. But they remember it, you know, and, and uh, Miss Glenn and, and all the others, there's, there's just so many good teachers there. But as far as teaching women, like I said, there's some things that a man especially can't teach in the same way, especially just by preaching. You know, and you notice as you go through this passage, the list of things that the women are supposed to teach is kind of a really long list compared to what he actually mentions for the men to teach. And I believe some of that is just because Titus was a man. And Paul was writing to him, he was a man, and Pastor Bailey's a man, and I'm, I'm a man. I've got that in common with him. And there's some of these things that it's just, you know, we can preach on the principles of it, but not necessarily show you how to live it out in, in real life. So let's look at a few of those things. In verse 4 it says, that they may teach the, uh, the young women to be sober. There's that word sober again. You know, the world doesn't really... If you watch a TV show with a popular teenager or something, not that you can hardly watch any, but they're not going to be this sober, serious person that has, you know, thoughts about life and serving the Lord and things like that. It's going to be more about being flippant and getting attention and things like that. Um, one definition of sober is earnest, earnestly thoughtful character or demeanor, marked by temperance. Um, which is self-control or held within limits. So, so women need to be teaching younger women how to have that earnest, um, thoughtful character. Careful about what you say and things like that. Sober, great, or I'm sorry, sober. And then it says to love their husbands. We're in verse 4. To love their husbands and to love their children. Now, you know, at least today... Usually people get married by choice because they love each other. So, you know, a woman, woman gets married, she probably already loves her husband. But that doesn't mean she doesn't need to be shown how to love her husband. You know, be taught as a child growing up, you know, by her mother, by others in the church, how you need to love your husband. Um, and again, it's something that's hard to put into words just as a pastor preaching. But as an older woman that's been married a long time, you can take that younger woman under your wing and teach her how to love her husband. Um, you know, the world's not going to teach that. The world's going to say, man, you guys are having problems. You probably just need to split up. I mean, he sounds like a jerk. A Christian uh, circle of women, may, they need to give different advice than that. They may need to say, look, it's tough. He, he may be wrong, but you still need to love him. You need to be faithful to him and, you know, give him the, the truth rather than just what they want to hear or what the world's going to be telling them. And you'll see a lot of these things what we need to teach them as Christians are completely opposite of what the world's going to teach them. How to love your husbands. To love your children. There's another one. Isn't that natural for a woman to love her children? Why would they need to learn that? I mean, you, 
have a baby, you can't hardly help but love them. Um, but we see just a couple of pages back in Timothy chapter or Second Timothy chapter three, verse one. It talks about the end times. It says, "This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come." And he talks about some things that are unnatural. In verse three, it says, "People will be without natural affection." You know, when you look at a law like they just passed in New York, you can see that people are without natural affection for babies. And especially if today, if you're for women's rights, which they're not really for women's rights, but if you're labeled as for women's rights, you almost have to be for abortion. You have to be for things that are completely evil and wrong. And we need Christian women to teach them how to love their children and that that's right. But not only that, but um, how do you love your children? Not just to do it, but for instance, maybe you have a baby and you think, man, I just love them too much to see them hurt. I just, I love them too much to spank them, you know, for instance. Well, yeah, that's a natural feeling. That's a natural motherly instinct. But we need to teach these young ladies that if you want your children to live for the Lord, you're going to have to discipline them. Um, he who loves his son chastens him betimes. He who spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him chastens him the times. So, again, uh, something that can be taught by women that have had children to women that are having children. Something that can be taught by mature Christians. And, and that's another thing that I meant to touch on, but it doesn't just have to do with age. You know, you might get saved at 50 years old and you're a brand new baby Christian. And somebody else is the same age as you, but they've been in church their whole life. There's things that you can learn from that mature Christian. And there's things that you can teach somebody that just got saved. I remember in high school, one of my good friends got saved out of a horrible lifestyle. He'd never been around God. He'd been into partying and drugs and alcohol and everything you can imagine. And he got saved at 17. And one day he was at my house and he saw this box of all these old cartoon videotapes, the Hanna-Barbera uh, Bible stories, you know, David and Goliath, uh, Daniel and the lion's den, Moses and, and the Red Sea and all these things. And he was like, wow, you watched that growing up? And I said, yeah. He said, I've, he had never heard those stories, I mean, at all. And so he borrowed that whole thing from me, and he just watched them all so he could just catch up on just the basics of the Old Testament and, and Bible stories. Um, so there's a lot of people that are our age that maybe are not mature Christians. But anyway, we need to help these, these young ladies learn to love their husbands, to love their children. Um, the next thing is, in verse 5, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home. I want to touch on those first two, discreet and chaste. Um, discreet, it means showing discernment or good judgment in conduct and speech. Showing discernment or good judgment in conduct or speech. It also can mean modest. And again, you contrast this with the world, and it's not about being modest. It's not about having good judgments. It's about being flippant, just shooting your mouth off, getting attention, um, getting a rise out of people to get attention. And we see that a lot, but as Christians, we should be discreet, especially Christian young ladies, but Christian young men too. Uh, we should be discreet and then chaste, pure in thought and act is a good definition for chaste. Moral purity here. And again, another word is modest. Um, now, this is another one of those things. Pastor Bailey can stand up here and preach on the principles of modesty. And we can talk about that over in the youth group. But there's a whole difference to older, mature women showing young ladies how to be modest, how to act modest, how to behave in a pure way, and, and just how it carries out. I remember one thing that Michelle always... Um, admired, or she's brought up a few times, is uh, Miss Bailey, our pastor's wife, is, wow, she judged how to dress modest, and she still is in style, and she still looks good, and she she just liked that there was a combination there. Pastor Bailey, you nodding your head, you probably like that too, <laughs> I bet. <laughs> um, but again, that's something that, that needs to be taught by, you know, by women that understand it, that kind of have been there and done that, and things like that, that I could never really teach on. Um, 
they don't get that from the world. And I'm sorry, a lot of times I don't have a lot of notes, so I'm like trying to keep up with where I am in my notes here. But, you know, the world certainly doesn't teach that. In fact, um, even at a young age, they start teaching the complete opposite of that. And you start hearing everything totally different than being modest. And, um, you know, if you watch any kind of show, even like Disney Channel children's shows, anything like that, doesn't doesn't help movies. Um, I actually was pulling up to a gas station one night. And I had the kids in the back, and I won't say which one of the kids said this because it probably would embarrass them for good reason. Um, But there was this big, nice, fancy truck, and this guy got out, and he looked pretty sharp, and his girlfriend got out, and they, you know, they looked cool or whatever. My kid said, man, that is a Texie truck. I said, what? They said, yeah, those guys are Texie. I was like, Number one, I don't. That's not a real word. Just so you know. <laughs> and number two, we don't say that. But you know, where did you get that? We were like, where did they get that? Did they get that from other kids around? Where was it? Well, it turns out they were watching like some innocent, you know, animated movie. But at the end, it rolls over to talking about how they created the characters and everything, and they were talking about one of the characters being a taxi, you know. Um, but. You know, it doesn't take long to get in the world that, hey, you got to be texy to fit in and to get attraction and to, to try to attract the guys or whatever. Um, and so it's going to take Christian, godly women teaching young ladies how to attract the right men for the right reasons and things like that. Um, so moving on here, keepers at home. You know, that's another important, important lesson is to be a keeper at home when you're the, the wife. That's, that's kind of a sign to you. That doesn't mean you're the housekeeper. It doesn't mean that you have to do all the house chores. Michelle, you don't have to listen to this part. But, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, the home is really a, a, it's a place where a woman can have a huge impact on raising the children. Another thing that keeper means is actually protector. Like in soccer, you know, the keeper in the goalie is to protect that goal. And sometimes as a woman, you have to protect your children. You have to protect your household. Um, And you turn over to Proverbs 31, and there's a really good description of a godly woman. And I'll tell you what, she's not lazy. She's not idle. She's not just doing housework. I mean, she's got servants she's organizing. She's organizing, buying a field and selling it, making sure her family's taken care of. Um, And it says strength and honor or her clothing. Um, And again, you know, what does it mean to be a keeper at home? It'd be hard for me to describe all that, but we need some godly examples for these young ladies to follow. Um, And then it says, uh, let's see, obedient, it says good and obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. You know, you say obedient to your own husband today, and it's like, man, if you're in political office, you're out of there, man, you know. Um, that's so against the grain of the world these days. And, of course, it doesn't mean that the woman doesn't have a say or that she's a doormat or anything like that because um, if you have a good relationship, you should completely honor what your wife's opinion is and what she has to say if you want to have a happy marriage. But <laughs> I I was told to tread lightly on that part. So. Um, but it is something that women need to understand. What does that mean? And um, I tell Michelle every time she's gone that Pastor Bailey preaches on that. But um, anyway. but women need good, good examples of that. And why do they need to do these things is what's important here. It says that the word of God be not blasphemed. You know, why is it important that they take care of their home, that they have a good relationship with their husband, that they love their children and they love their husband. Because we've all seen when a house falls apart, and of course it's not that that's the woman's fault, it's more on the man, the man's more responsible. But when a house falls apart, it's a bad testimony to everyone. I mean, we've all tried to witness to somebody before that said, well, I knew some Christians and they were just scum of the earth or whatever it is. You know, he did this, she did this. They couldn't, keep, they couldn't stay together because of some silly reason, whatever it was. But when our homes don't 
stay together and they have problems, it's a poor reflection on God's word. And that's why these things are so important. Now we get on to the men. Last time we had an ice cream fellowship afterwards, so I was glad to let y'all out early tonight. I don't I've got 14 more minutes, but I don't. <laughs> only got one page left, so we'll see. All right, verse 6. Young men likewise exhort to be sober minded. You know, and that word likewise I have written next to it by example, because how are the women supposed to teach the men or, or teach the younger women? By example. Well, likewise. Uh, exhort the the younger men to be sober-minded. Of course, this is to Titus, but it's really to all of us. We need to teach by example the younger men, again, to be sober-minded. And it seems like I'm being repetitive maybe when I keep saying sober and sober and sober, but that's what is all throughout this chapter. So it's important. Our young people need to learn to be sober-minded. That doesn't mean you can't ever have any fun, but when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to living for the Lord, it's a serious thing. And sometimes we need to take it seriously. Um, And then verse 7 says, In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. Um, You know, when he says all things, he's talking about every different area of your life. You know, when you think of a pattern, kind of stays consistent over and over and over. It, it repeats itself over and over and over. And as a man, we need to make sure that our lives are consistent in that we're a Christian and we're living for the Lord at church, but we're also living for the Lord when we go to work. And maybe you have some kind of a club or you know something that you're a part of, or you're living for God there. Maybe you have a workout group of guys or you know a motorcycle group um, club or something like that? Are you living for God in those other areas? And um, it should show a pattern of good works. And I'll tell you today, uh, young men really need encouragement just to act like men. I mean, the world is totally against that. You know, even if you see, I've seen some of my kids watch a show with some teenagers in it. And it's not bad. It doesn't have any bad language. It doesn't have any bad, you know, immorality or anything like that. But you look at some of the guys that are in the show, and they're just like, man, I hope my kids don't act like that. I don't think I can let them watch that anymore because they just, maybe they just act like a bunch of sissies. Or they just, you know, they're just kind of sassy. And they, you know, they talk like the teenage girls in the show, too. And the world doesn't even... They just don't even want manliness to be a factor now. They just want it to be totally uh, feminized, and and they think that's normal. You know, I've got a feminine side, and she's back there. Say hi. Um, (laughs) But these guys need to learn how to act manly, and when manliness is portrayed by the world, it's usually in an ungodly way. It's not manliness. It's just immorality. It's just lack of self-control, it's really not manliness at all, but who are they going to learn that from uh, if, except that we teach them by example? And of course, preaching as well. Um, so in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good work. Um, you know, another thing is, are, are we faithful to God in all these different areas? And do our children see that pattern? You know, as Fathers and husbands, our own household really gets to see that. And we've got to be careful, um, again, that we're not one way at church and one way at home and, and different, you know, for different things, um, including when it's only guys. You know, sometimes there's this thought that, hey, it's just the guys, there's no women and children, we can talk how we want. Well, it's not about offending women and children, it's about offending God and keeping your speech uh, to that that glorifies and edifies and um, that God will be happy with. And so again, too often we we say one thing, but then we don't show that example to our young men, and we need to, to be sure about that. Um, then it says, sound in doctrine. In doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, and sincerity. 
you know, we've got to be sound um, in verse 1, but we've got to show uncorruptness. You know, that word um, uncorrupt is, you know, it can also mean sound, it can mean sure. And again, how's your doctrine outside the church? Um, another thing that young men need to learn is just um, various ways that you live out a Christian lifestyle. For instance, business. Um, you know, how do you handle your family? How do you love your wife? All those different things that, you know, we know need to be the case, but how do we actually do that? And if you're a younger man here, I would encourage you to look to find some older men that you look up to that you can say, that's a godly person that I can implement some things from or ask questions from. Um, I've talked to John Brewer several times and said, hey, John, this is something going on in the family, and I, I would like to get some godly counsel and get your input on this. And other things, I've talked to Eric Weatherington in my business. Hey, how would you handle something like this? Because I know he's got a, a, a lot of employees under him, and I can go to him and get some godly counsel. Now, don't get me wrong. That counsel will never take the place of the Bible. It, it, you know, there's never going to be a man that is going to be uh, perfect and, and, you know, totally reliable. But we can learn these things um, from older men as well, and we can teach them younger men. Um, finally, it says in, uh, in verse 11 and 12, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. You know, a lot of people today use grace as an excuse to say, well, we're not under the law, we're under grace, so I can listen to whatever music I want. You know, We're not under the law, we're under grace, so I can do this activity, or they'll use that as an excuse for drinking, living together, any, anything like that. But when you see this verse, it shows us that grace teaches us something, just like we should be teaching younger Christians. What does it teach us, really? It teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts we should live soberly, there's that word again, righteously and godly in this present world. And so that's what we should all be striving for. And I just want to ask you as a church to try to help us influence people that are younger than you. Teenagers, certainly. Young adults, certainly. Young Christians. But know that people are watching you. Know that your children are watching you. Know that we're watching you in, in a service. And, and if you're younger, you need to glean from that. You know, I love going on visitation and getting put with somebody older than me. And I think that always happens. Um, <laughs> but the other day it was Pastor Bailey, Brother Zipper, Brother Lon. I learned so much, though, from, from you guys. I learned, you know, just talking about how, even how you approach somebody with the gospel. How do you handle your visitation? How, do, how it used to be and how it is now. And, and um, you know, guys, if you're younger, you need to be looking for those examples and ways that you can learn from people on, on how to be a better Christian, godly people that you, that you trust. And then, again, as a church, we've got to be thinking about that, people watching us and how can we influence them to live for the Lord. So with that, I'll close. And um, Pastor Bailey, if you want to come and Elizabeth come if she would we're gonna have an invitation song 496 if you need a book I surrender all I appreciate the emphasis of the message tonight and certainly uh, very practical very helpful and reminds us that we do need to be an example all of us need an example and we all can be an example from the oldest all the way down to the youngest um, even older kids in the youth group can be an example to the younger kids coming into the youth group the older people can be an example. I've learned from some of you of things that you do that, that are a challenge to me. So what a great emphasis tonight. What a help. Let's stand and sing 496. And if God's dealt in your heart tonight, if you need to respond, if you need to find a place of prayer, the best time to do that is during the invitation.
So why don't you come tonight as we sing 496. appreciate the message, young people. I appreciate the specials tonight. That was a blessing. I appreciate the young people that were involved and helpful. Um, we have some workers that help Michael as well. Um, uh, I know, I think they're here, Julie and PJ are around here somewhere. There they are. They help on Wednesday night. They help influence our young people. I think Ryan Aldridge, we can get him off work. He helps us with our young people as well. So all the people investing there. And then, of course, our Awana. We start the people early there and get a number of folks. We couldn't do it without these people that are involved. And, of course, it's not these people. It's you people who, who help us with this. And we certainly appreciate all our teachers. You know, a lot of our ministry here is involved with young people, starting with Sunday school, through the Awana program, through the youth, and then, of course, we do other things as well. But that's a real blessing. And, boy, what do we need? We need to train and influence our young people. I mean, part of it's the preaching. That's important. But, boy, it starts, it starts young, uh, from the nursery on up. So what a blessing to have folks who are praying, involved, and excited about what's going on. And we just trust that we'll uh, continue to see fruit from that. Let's go ahead and dismiss in prayer tonight. And uh, I am going to ask uh, Zach if he'll close us.